Okay, it's 5.30. We can start now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It is 5.30, and I will be calling. It is actually on March 14th, 2023, and I'm calling the Sugarland Parks Board meeting to order. And for those that are on the board here, turn on your mics if you can. Thank you. So the first item over here, I want to make sure that we have um, public comment, public hearing. Is anyone here for public comment, public hearing? No. No. Thank you very much. With that said, we'll go ahead and um, see what we have. Yeah. We'll go ahead and go to the item number two. Excuse me, no, item number three. So the workshop review of and discussion of the culture arts project approval process and upcoming projects. So I have Ms. Patty Holly, culture art coordinator, and Nicole Solis, assistant director of environmental and neighborhood services. So thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Solis. I am one of two assistant directors for environmental and neighborhood services, which is quite a mouthful, so we should call ourselves ENF. Um, and Patty and I are here today to provide the board an update on cultural arts, which has been quite a while since we last did this meeting. I believe it was in August. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, in September, um, Cultural arts did transition from economic development over to the EF. Um, this is done for a few reasons. Um, one of which is the city was really looking to um, assess how we approach public art and the work was associated with that approval. Um, so later on in the presentation, I will go over some of our modifications to the workflow um, that we implemented to expedite the approval process for our work. Um, we also um, Move cultural arts over to ENS just because of the very nature of ENS. A wide a variety of divisions within ENS puts us in constant contact with departments across the organization. And really, what we want to do is make cultural arts as visible as possible so that other departments, while they're working on their own individual projects, um, always are mindful of opportunities to work with cultural arts and implement art into their into their own into their own projects. I need to turn on the microphone. <laughs> um, so um, we have again in EMS a wide array of divisions from um, fleet to facilities to uh, code enforcement to solid waste to stormwater. Um, our food inspection division. So we interact with departments across the organization on a regular basis, and we really wanted to make cultural arts as visible as possible. So ENS is excited to welcome cultural arts into our department um, and really look forward to working with the board as well to work toward beautifying the community and uh, making it a very inviting place for artists to come in and um, do great work. Uh, which we can't do without great staff. Uh, so I want to reintroduce, I want to reintroduce Patty Holly. She <laughs> was promoted to a full-time position as our uh, cultural arts coordinator. And she has been really holding down the fort all by herself since our last cultural arts manager left. Um, and she's been vital in uh, working through those process improvements and um, looking for new opportunities for um, programs. So um, I am incredibly excited um, for her to have an opportunity to go uh, to review with you all of the projects that she's been working on and which really we hope to lay the groundwork for what we hope to be is an explosion of artwork in the community in the future. So um, I also want to introduce Shay Davis. She is our new cultural arts manager. Um, so she's a multidisciplinary artist and art administrator. She got her BA in design, um, all while uh, serving in the Air Force active duty for seven years. Thank you, Shay, for your great, great work. Um, and she um, worked. She has worked with several arts organizations um, throughout the city of Houston, working to um, create programming, um, grant opportunities, exhibition 
um, several live events. Um, she's also on the board of the Grammy Academy, um, and it is a, the sitting chair of the International Organization for Women in Music. So, let's welcome Shay. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Patty um, to review some of those workflow modifications that we've uh, implemented in the future arts. Hello, everyone. Like Nicole said, if you haven't met me before, I'm the Cultural Arts Coordinator here at the city. I feel like I know most of you, um, if not all of you, so good to see you again. Um, so we do have some project updates to share with you, um, but before we get to those specifically, um, we'd like to share, like Nicole was saying, some project approval workflow updates. Um, so this is different than what we typically present to the park board, but with the new staffing changes and departmental shifts, we're, we've been taking a hard look at how we can increase our efficiency across the board and just the way that we have projects approved. Um, all of this is with the goal of getting a high number of artworks up within the city on a reduced timeline. Um, and because you all as the Parks Board are so integral to a, a lot of our processes, be it you know the approval of the concepts themselves, as well as the artwork design selection committees, we wanted to keep you in the loop regarding the challenges that we face and the solutions that we found for how to move forward. So um, the process outlined currently in the city's public art plan for how to propose new projects is through the approval of an annual public art work plan, which you guys are used to seeing. This is the full list of projects that we propose roughly a year in advance. That process starts in January for um, implementation starting in October or November. Um, so you all as the Parks Board typically review a full list of potential projects and ultimately recommend um, what becomes the full plan to SL4B and City Council in advance of next fiscal year's budget. Um, However, the last time that you all have, have seen a true uh, work plan has been in 2021. Um, since in 2022, our last cultural arts manager uh, um, left the city and we've been proceeding since then on a project by project basis. Um, so that leads us to some of the challenges with that we've encountered using the annual public art work plan. Um, as you can see, this, uh, this entire process from start to finish currently takes 10 to 11 months um, just to get projects approved, um, let alone the contracting and the actual artist solicitation of everything. Um, that means if any special event comes up in the city, for example, um, a special festival, or if, for example, the Space Cowboys won a big game, um, anything that's not known about a year in advance, cultural arts has historically not had the opportunity to jump on those um, projects quickly and provide artworks for them just because they wouldn't have the chance to be approved in time. Um, to make this into a visual, um, we mapped out what our current process looks like just to get projects approved. Um, this is for the annual public art work plan. So that first step begins in January all the way to the end of the map, like I said, um, ending in uh, October, November. Um, so as you can see, we have several entities that we currently report to, um, the Parks Board, the EDC, SL4B, Council, et cetera. Um, this is what we've been proceeding under uh, since March of 2022, this individual project workflow. And as you can see, we're still, we've still been going to all of these different boards. Um, the trouble that we run into is that, you know, all, all of these boards, you know, with, with council as somewhat of the exception, meet on a monthly basis. And we also have to see them um, in a certain order. So if for any reason, you know, any of these boards cancel a, a meeting for, uh, you know, any reason. Um, we're looking at taking what's already a three month process and stretching it out, adding another month at least to even get all of the boards to see our projects once, okay? I mentioned earlier that um, these challenges have historically not allowed us to take advantage of new project opportunities quickly. I wanted to show you this mural as an example of what other divisions are doing. So this is a mural currently at First Colony Mall painted by Houston-based artist Donkey Boy. Um, it was commissioned by our Visit Sugarland Tourism Marketing Team uh, and was installed in March 2022 to celebrate the launch of the Sugarland Space Cowboys. So Cultural Arts, our office assisted in the contract consulting for this project, but since it was not funded using our funding, um, it, it did not require the same project approvals. As a result, this project took between three and four months from start to finish. Uh, also, I could not include a picture of this because it's 
because it is so brand new. But the new pavement mural down at Sugarland Town Square, if you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to go out to the unveiling event this Thursday at 11. Um, but that's another project sponsored by our Visit Shore Sugarland Tourism team, for which we recommended the artist, but it was not funded through us. That project took even less. It was a two month time span. So we're looking at 10 to 11 months on our end to even start um, versus two to four months start to finish. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is the this is the workflow we will be moving forward with um, for future projects. Instead of an annual public art work plan at the start of the year, Cultural Arts is going to be proposing individual project plans to the Parks Board throughout the year as project opportunities arise. They will contain an overall concept and budget overview, then with a memo distributed back to you all as the board once a final artist and design is selected. As you all can see, uh, this, this makes the Parks Board our main touch point for getting projects approved moving forward before they go um, to city management and or council. Um, in addition, we're going to be continuing our current practice of um, having one to two Parks Board members on all of our artwork design selection committees. Um, if you've never served on one of our committees before, this is a voting panel of project stakeholders, some of which are Parks Board members that select the actual final artist and design for the project. So with very few exceptions, cultural arts staff are typically not voting members on that board. So uh, the committee really has the say in determining what artworks are getting installed in, in Sugar Land. Um, so after the selection committee results, we will, like I said, update the parks board with a memo outlining that final design, as well as invite you all as the full board to each of our artwork unveiling events. Um, Establishing parks as the main project touch point for these approvals is, I hope, a testament to how integral you all have been um, in, in helping us get our projects on the ground. So we also want to thank you for your continued work with us and also encourage you, if you've never served on a selection committee before, please do. It's a lot of fun and also gives you uh, an important say in what we, what we do. Through implementing these proposed changes, uh, like I said, this takes our, our workflow um, from 11 months to as little as two to three months, uh, depending on the method of artwork so of artist selection. They will also allow us to jump on new projects quickly, including temporary installations. Right. With this in mind, we're going to kick things off by starting this workflow um, with some project plans. So these are projects that we are looking at for the remainder of the calendar year, 2023 for implementation. The first are four botanical shade bent sculptures with a total budget of $217,000. These four sculpture designs that you'll see were originally selected as part of the Sweet Seats Bent Project in 2021. It was originally an all in for SLPX project, but was unable to move forward due to pending county funding. However, we're reviving it this year with our own funding. The first of those sculptures being Bluebells by Richard Herzog with a budget of $50,000 for placement in Oyster Creek Park. Um, the sculpture is made of aluminum and will be placed near the entrance of the park as a welcome and entrance piece. Um, so you can see in our right right there. Richard Herzog will also be creating a second piece for us entitled Lunaria for placement uh, at Smart Financial Center Plaza for $20,000. We don't have a rendering for this piece at the location, but this photo shows where it will be placed with the venue um, being framed in the background to encourage social media interaction at events and, and concerts. Next is Dogwoods, and you see a lovely picture of me there. <laughs> I love it not woods, but that shows you the scale. Or thirty-eight thousand uh, dollars. This piece is made of stainless steel and will be installed along the walking trail at the head of Eldridge Park. This will also be the first piece, uh, the first art piece for Eldridge Park. So it gives us a unique opportunity to distribute art into that part of the city. And then finally, um, this is an oak leaf inspired bench by Nate and Watkins Design uh, to be installed for eighty-nine thousand dollars at the start of the Brazos River Park Connector Trailhead. Um, so this location sits at the start of several trails for both hiking and mountain biking. So it gives a resting opportunity to engage with those communities, as well as, you know, a chance to incorporate some more interest points along these trails. 
Um, the design you see uh, at the left was originally inspired by a sugarcane plant, but we've asked the artist to make a revision to incorporate oak leaves rather than sugarcane plants um, around a similar color scheme and design framework. So those colors are going to tie in beautifully with the new uh, Placegate Pavilion that, that's going to be unveiled soon at Brazos River Park, but also complement uh, the local oak trees that are native to the area. Okay, so those are our shade bench structures. The next few projects that we have coming up, we are very excited about because they are a new pilot for us. Um, they are three artwork sponsorships. Um, so these will be where the division will provide reimbursement to external partners to commission public artworks from city approved artists. Um, for these and all future sponsorships, artwork ownership and maintenance responsibility will pass to the sponsored um, party upon installation. Designs for the prospective artworks will also be required to adhere to city given deliverables um, and will be commissioned from, like I said, a list of pre approved artists. Um, the artwork commissioning process will also be managed externally by the sponsored party who will each receive <laughs> training on best practices regarding art acquisition. So, again, our goal on getting as much artwork up as possible, we're now um, allowing other people to come into that process. The first of which, this is Barlow Bench by Colin Selig. This is a fifth seating sculpture, um, also um, originally a part of the Sweet Seats Bench project. Um, this would be a sponsorship for $14,000 between the city and the Greatwood community. The location for this piece you see listed as uh, TBD because at the time when this presentation was submitted, it was still with their um, homeowners association for um, consideration of location. However, I just heard back this morning um, from their HOA representative that the artwork is to be placed at their public recreation center playground. So this Great Wood sponsorship is obviously with a design that was already pre-approved for another city project. Um, however, these next two sponsorships will be commissions for entirely new artworks requiring a, a new design, everything. Um, on these and any other new sponsorships requiring a new design, we're going to require from the sponsored party that they still um, incorporate an artwork selection committee of their own. And those selection committees will be required to have a parks board representative as well as one cultural arts representative, whether it is shade or high as well. So the next two, like I said, are for design and installation. Um, and they're both tourism murals in the amount of $33,000, the first being for Smart Financial Center. So for this project in particular, Smart Financial Center came to us with a particular challenge in mind. Um, so as touring artists come to Smart Financial as maybe, you know, the ninth, tenth stop on their, for example, their national tour, um, their staff noticed that for the performers, all the venues begin to blend together. So much so that when some artists go on stage, they say things like, Welcome to Houston. Thanks for having me, Houston. Um, and obviously, we want to promote that that these awesome events are happening in Sugarland. So that's the goal for our for our first tourism piece at um, Smart Financial Center. Um, so we're going to emphasize a Sugarland specific location among performers and encourage social media promotion for the venue. So this hallway along their artist dressing room area is the primary location. These are some stylistic examples. Like I said, we don't have a design yet, um, but these are examples of artworks that serve as an inspiration for the project. It's gonna be a graffiti style with themes related to music and music making, as well as a spot for viewers to pose with the artwork like you see on the left. The text Sugarland, Texas will also be featured to promote again, that location specific goal for the artwork. Um, and although that hallway is the priority location, um, Smart Financial Center is also considering utilizing the budget to expand the project to include a front of house lobby mural as well. <clears throat> and the last sponsorship we're looking at um, is also another tourism mural, same uh, budget for, uh, for, sorry, installation at Fort Bend Real Estate uh, along Highway 90 with the potential for a complimentary design located on Blendon Coffee Club, the patio wall. Okay. Um, so goals for this project are also to promote Sugarland tourism, but um, in addition, it will serve as an entrance piece for um, drivers entering Sugarland down Highway 90 from Stafford in the greater Houston area. 
Um, complementing the historic district redevelopment that's happening, really exciting, reflect Sugarland's history and heritage, and also give another chance to promote the city on social media as well. This project is going to feature, again, the text Sugarland, Texas, but will utilize imagery promoting tourism to the Sugarland Historic District, um, utilizing imagery you know, from our neighborhood, but also Sugarland history as well. And these are just a few examples. The, the um, Aside from the top right, both of these murals are located in Houston. Altogether, Cultural Arts will have an artwork budget of $297,000 for these artworks to be installed within the 2023 calendar year, including four artworks commissioned through the city and three artwork sponsorships. In addition, the current Brook Street Bridge Mosaic Extension and Sculpture Project for Fire Station 3 are still underway, meaning that the division should see a total of nine new art projects installed in the city by the end of the calendar year. As you can see, this is a bold undertaking by us um, with a goal, again, to get a high number of, art, of high quality public artworks distributed throughout the city on a quicker timeline. Um, there are several factors that will be that will allow us to expand in this way, notably revising that project approval workflow like we talked about, um, establishing full, two full-time division staff, um, outsourcing the artist contracting by way of those three sponsorships, and the last point, and this will be my closing point, establishing a pre-qualified artist roster. So this is something we are very excited about in a way, a, an additional way to streamline our contracting processes. So once established, this roster is going to be a list of pre-approved local and national artists who may receive invitations for public art projects commissioned by the city. So as those opportunities are defined and funded, um, cultural arts would have the ability to reach out to one or more of those roster artists to go through a simplified design selection process for a potential commission. So then rather than publish a separate job application for each of these separate projects, we would have the ability to select a few artists directly to propose to a design selection committee. So that's still remaining an integral part of the process, but just speeds up the applications. Um, so our roster application closes on March 31st, and once it's active, it will be in place for the next three years. We currently have over 100 applicants to be on the roster and with an artist information event set for next Thursday, so it's going really well. We have the opportunity to go beyond this roster if we have a project for which, for whatever reason, the roster artist wouldn't be a great fit, but this is going to be an amazing resource for us to be able to have greater flexibility in contracting for these projects. So. That was a lot of information on a lot of different topics, but um, that that's what we have to share with you. We're really excited and want to open it up to questions if you have any. So to a prior understanding, so the okay. current status in terms of the process from start to finish is about 10 to 11 months. 10 roughly. to 11 months to get the projects themselves approved. So for example, if we say we want um, a, a sculpture at Wizard Creek Park, mm -hmm. even to get that concept approved is what takes 10 to 11 months in okay. the contracting on top of it and then what you're proposing on a, the lighter slider it's a modified version this is what you're going after pre-selected pre-qualified selection process what's that going down to be in terms of that selection approval process i will say for the artist selection it depends on the project we there there may be you know um, a project where it is useful to get more than one proposal for example something i'm thinking structural um where you know artists may have very different approaches to the way that you know, the a bridge improvement, for example. Um, if it's something like a mural where we're really familiar, especially if it's a local artist with that artist design uh, process, we could contract them directly, no problem. I think, I mean, the pavement mural outside at Sugarland Town Square, like I said, took as little as two months. So I would say at a minimum, probably two months, but if we get proposals from other artists, we can enter into design contract with them immediately and maybe stretch it out to three. Okay, so follow up question on that. Sure. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no, you have other questions. I'm taking all the time, but so I would assume the uh, is it, no, I'm assuming it's going to be an RFQ process with different categories because there's different types of art out there. You yes, got painting, murals, structures. 
whatever. I mean, there's multitude. So is yeah. that where you're going to have ca different categories yes. in terms of the selection process? Great question. So the roster application as it is now lets artists select uh, what what medium, what genre they, they specify with. And something exciting that we're actually working on is that we're expanding that to encompass performing arts as well. Yeah. So we that that's something later down the road that, that we're going to be excited to share with you, but we're including musicians and performing artists in that process as well. Um, we want to see diverse artwork in Sugarland, um, not not just in, in the people represented, but the genres as well. So um, we allow artists to specify what they specify, what they specialize in and choose multiple specialties in case they are a painter and a sculptor, for example. We also give artists the opportunity to identify as either an emerging or established artist. So established is someone who uh, on the visual art side may have created two or three projects at $15,000 or more, but emerging artists might give an opportunity to, um, for example, we're, we're opening this to artists age 18 and older. So if, if we have a project in mind, um, a smaller project that would be a better fit for an emerging artist, we want to give them those opportunities as well. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Kelly, just a quick one. Um, I wasn't here, I think, for the meeting when you were first presenting. Can you go over again how on the sponsored projects, yes. how do those divide up financially? Is is the city of Sugarland responsible for the 33000 or is the sponsoring entity or both? How does that? Yes. So the $33,000 is the total sponsorship budget, and that is all city funded, uh, provided that now there are contract touch points along the way, um, you know, and they have to meet those touch points and meet our, our city deliverables in order to be uh, awarded that reimbursement. For example, there, um, you know, if the artwork in the tourism mural case doesn't prominently feature the art, the tech, Sugarland, Texas, we're not going to fund them for the artwork. But it has to be funding for the artwork that we ask for, but it is all city funded and it's reimbursement. So the sponsored party is putting the cost up front. And um, once they submit the required deliverables, we reimburse them. Okay. So there's no, like for an entity like Smart Financial, there's no skin in the game for that, no. essentially. Okay. Correct. Any other questions? One. Okay. Um, you mentioned that diverse representation of the artists is important. Um, how are you getting the word out uh, to solicit artists to apply for the roster? Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Shay's doing a great job. She's only been here for, I don't know, four weeks. And she's like, Shay is so well connected. Do you want to come up here and talk about it? I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'm throwing her under the bus. She's so cool. <laughs> Hi, um, so I work with several arts organizations in the city of Houston. So the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, Houston's Arts Alliance, Fresh Arts Organizations, Art Show Houston, they have all been posting our flyer. They have all guaranteed us their artists will be not only in attendance, but they're going to be live streaming these events, inviting all of their friends. And we have a VIP roster list that is currently filling up. So we're reaching out to artists all around the city of Houston, Sugarland, Katy, Cypress. Like we want local artists. We do have quite a few um, applications from national artists, but I feel like the closer you are to Sugarland, the more you understand the story here and the better that translates into the arts that we're requesting. So we're getting a lot of local artists and a lot of our local arts organizations involved. Um, so they're sending their artists here so we can kind of steal them. <laughs> so to follow up that question, uh, regards to, are y'all submitting as part of the advertisement RFQ process? Uh, but you're also reaching out to other organizations within the city of Houston. Uh, this is drastically different from the city, the city of Sugarland's process from before. Um, you know, I hate to see that other artists missing out because they didn't, they weren't um, aware of this new process. How long has the advertisement going on, or at least the news to reach out to other organizations for the? call for artists so the pro this has been out for quite some time a couple months now um but we are not eliminating other people's opportunities to submit to projects these are just artists that we'll have on call in the event we don't find what we need in our open call so if we put out an open call and we're not getting what it is that 
you know, we'll be bringing those, you know, those proposals to selection boards. If we don't find what we're looking for, then we go to our roster. So it's not like we're going to go straight to them. We don't want to create a process that eliminates other people's opportunities. What we do want to do is make sure we're efficient when we're starting to get these artworks out. Um, for instance, right now, Fire Station 3, we have been through so many proposals. It's been five months. Um, and not having, you know, a roster to go to immediately after submitting so many proposals, it sends us right back out into open call, which could be another couple months. Um, so instead of doing that, we go right to that pre-qualified roster and start looking through there and seeing who can we give an opportunity to. But also, you know, there has to be recognition that there is an emerging artist um, section of that pre-qualified yeah. roster that is also giving opportunities to people who have never been, you know, had the opportunity to be commissioned. Okay, that's great to hear that you're giving yourself flexibility all at the same time, giving the new artists, emerging artists outside yes. to also make that call. So I think you mentioned this pre-qualification is for three years in terms of them yes. being qual pre-qualified. I have something to add to that if you don't mind. Yes, so the roster will be set for three years once it is established. However, we do have an amendment built in that should we, you know, should we find within those three years an artist that, you know, we want to, to be included on our roster, we think would benefit from being on the roster, that 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 list is not necessarily set in stone. We have the ability to add as we go. Okay. We're not removing as we go. We want as many artists as possible on this thing. Right. Uh, so that being said, just even if they aren't approved by that March 31st deadline, if we encounter someone, uh, for example, a really stellar Sugarland artist that, that needs to be a part of this, we will make sure they're involved. Okay, that's perfect. Just hate to start something in terms of, uh, yeah. it's almost like an idea queue, you know, I'm talking engineering now. Uh, so you get pre-selected, but then you're cut off. Yeah. I hate for that to happen. There's, you know, there's it's instances where artists come up, they move here, whatever the situation may be, uh, they want to be able to support the so local city like us and be able to have that. But annually, they may not understand we moved into this new process. But as long as you don't have the flexibility to add, I think that's fantastic. Any other questions, comments? Okay. okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate your time. All right, next item we have on here uh, is fact finding and recommendation uh, for consideration of an action on recommendation for the authorization of the Fort Bend Hike for Hope Volunteer Planning Committee's appeal for fee exemption to the city manager. So this is kind of keep in mind, this will require a, a vote. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. And Ms. Kimberly Terrell, will, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation, will be presenting. Great, thank you very much. So just as a background, um, the fees that we have in, uh, for the Parks Department are adopted by City Council annually in the fee ordinance. In 2006, City Council approved the City Ordinance to allow for a fee exemption from fees uh, if, they're meet, if the organization meets certain criteria. So the criteria for fee exemption are that um, it has to be an internal, uh, internal revenue service exempt entity must reside or have a PO box in the city of Sugar Land and the corporate city limits, must demonstrate a minimum of 51% of the membership reside in the city limits, the corporate city limits. The organizations must have a charitable purpose and the fundraiser has to be for the express benefit of Sugar Land residents. So the Fort Bend Hike for Hope Volunteer Planning Committee um, presented the exemption paperwork for their event, Hike for Hope at the Brazosburg Park Bowl. Um, and that's coming up on the uh, 15th of April. And that is representing the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention or the AFSP. Um, they presented their fee exemption. We reviewed the fee exemption. It was denied for the following reasons. It's representing the, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which is, it's a national organization. So their national organization address is in New York. And as you can imagine, representing a national organization, they're not gonna have 51%. Um, of Sugarland membership. There is a, a, a local chapter, the local chapter in parentheses, because it it has it represents 33 Texas counties. So as you can imagine, also the local chapter um, does not meet that criteria as well. 
So our policy uh, through the Parks Department um, allows the organization to submit an appeal if they are denied. That comes to y'all, um, and you can uh, they so they submit a letter, a submittal of request. Uh, you should have that in your packet, the letter from them, and then you review that appeal and you make a recommendation to the city manager. So I have tonight um, Angie. If you want to come up, Angie represents the Fort Bend County uh, Hike for Hope Volunteer Planning Committee. And if you want to introduce yourself and your folks, then um, I'm just going to let Angie say a few words about her, uh, her organization and about your event. Our organization. I'm just the the lucky duck that gets to be named <laughs> on the agenda. Um, so my name is Angie Balden, and I am one of the co-chairs. With honestly, Gretchen Yax is kind of our primary chair. Um, and then we have uh, Claudia Eubanks here with us that's going to help speak as well. Um, of course, I have to say thank you guys so much for allowing us to be here sitting here in this room and seeing what goes on with the Caribbean Resident School. Like, this is cool. And, and what's even better is the part that we you know, are hosting the event at that can really so graciously met us at um, is has some of the artwork you guys are discussing there. And it speaks so perfectly to uh, what we're trying to do here. So. Um, with that being said, I, I'm going to let you come speak a little bit. I'm sure. Um, first, a little bit about the beads. Uh, not necessarily Mardi Gras, but part of what does happen at this walk, it's a walk of remembrance, a walk of support. Um, also, it's a walk of awareness. Um, so each of the color beads represents a type of connection that each walker would have with the issue of suicide and suicide prevention or mental health. Um, so we just wanted to show a little bit, everyone that walks will have an opportunity to choose the bead that reflects their connection with it. Um, the great thing about the AFSP is that it is a national organization. However, it is a grassroots organization with the majority of these walks and um, fundraisers are done by the volunteer uh, members of the organization. So even though, yes, it is benefiting the national organization, the group that is organizing this walk and this event are all Sugarland residents. Um, the four chair, um, chair members of the organizing committee, they are all residents of Greatwood. And um, the I'm part of the volunteer committee, which is a, a little bit of a larger group, a lot of the members of that group are Sugarland residents. It is a Fort Bend hike for hope. So we do have other residents that are part of, you know, people that are helping us. But the organization of the walk is by Sugarland members. Now, what's important for us is, as Sugarland uh, residents is that we helped the walk here in Sugarland. Like Angie mentioned, this park is great. Um, the beauty of it alone, obviously, nature lends itself to better mental health. Um, but the murals, some of the murals are so tied with our um, our focus. You know, the mural that it's okay to not be okay, things like that. So that's why we wanted to have it here. We definitely want Sugarland to be in the forefront of this, you know, push for making it okay to talk about mental health. Everyone in the city of Sugarland that is tied with this walk um, can benefit from the programs that the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, will be doing with the funds that are raised um, through this walk. Um, there are educational programs that can be applied for for absolutely free um, that can be brought into schools or organizations um, companies. So there are programs for any organization um, to apply for. And that's really what we're doing is just trying to bring more awareness, trying to bring some funding um, to this really important topic. And we think that Sugarland, especially as indicated by these beautiful murals, you know, I think it would be very, it would be great to put us in the forefront of that fight against um, you know, against suicide and to bring education for suicide prevention. This is the first ever walk um, of this type in, in this area. There are others going on in the spring. For instance, there's one in Galveston. The city of Galveston has donated um, that 
facility to uh, the AFSP volunteers that organized that walk. Um, in Pasadena, for instance, there's also a walk there. The city of Pasadena has also donated um, and waived the fee for uh, that facility for their walk as well. Um, although traditionally, our group does not necessarily meet that criteria. The public need for this type of um, exposure, I think, is you know a very uh, pressing need. The organization that vol that, vo that volunteered to organize this walk is all Sugarland residents, and we've all been touched by the issue of suicide, mental health. Um, in one way or, or another, and we think it's important for the rest of the city to be able to have this venue and um, have this forum to, to join together. Are there any questions that we need to ask? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so we're happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, thank you for that, by the way. Sure. Uh, Heather, I think I saw you. Is there a registration fee for the walk? Sure. The registration is to to register. I'm sorry. Um, to register is free. You can register to walk, form a team, join a team, or to volunteer. And registration is free. Um, the money that has been raised so far, um, we do accept donations. We do have sponsors. Um, our goal. I just have to brag a little bit. Our goal for this being our first year was ten thousand dollars, and today we already reached nineteen thousand dollars. Wow. So, so thank you. Thank you. Have a question. I had a, a comment. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I concur that uh, we there is a need for awareness of uh, any kind of help. Uh, I'm a teacher, so my heart goes out to any child that is having trouble and cannot communicate or cannot find a place to go to be helped. And we just had a competition that is a state competition. And in this competition, the students do the art but they also have to talk about it and I can't tell you how many of my students surprised me with some personal experience that they had encountered in their home that was traumatic and so I I totally agree with you that we need to increase awareness in fact I'm, I'm almost quoting my kids as to why they did the art that they wanted to bring awareness to the kinds of situations that happen in homes that nobody knows about. So I, I totally agree that any way that we can increase awareness would be advantageous to so many people. Okay, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Um, just a, a sort of financial questions. What's the fee that we're talking about? I mean, how much is it? So the rental fee for the park is about $780. There's also a $980 deposit that will be refunded if everything's left as, as it is. Okay. And then the second part of this is how much of the funds that you raise will be used by the organization, you know, kind of Fort Bend County, Sugarland area? Like, does it all go up to national or how does that work? So uh, typically the way that the events work for AFSP is half of the money raised goes to the foundation for grants and research in forming these programs and half of the money stays local. So if somebody that works for a business here in Sugarland, if they want to have a presentation talk saves lives, we call somebody and they come in for free to this organization and they do a talk saves lives program. Um, we also have um, education material. Um, there's, uh, I think the ones for the high school is called More Than Sad. And uh, we have that. Um, my mom is on, she's one of what they call healing hands. When somebody reaches out to AFSP and they lost a child by suicide, they might get my mom's number. So she's trained to, to talk to those people. But there's a lot of, there's uh, survivors of suicide support groups where the local the local chapter would pay you to have somebody trained to facilitate that form of support group. So all of that stays in the local chapter and then there's somebody that's in charge of all the programs and she can take care of all that for us. Kelsey? Oh, and something else that AFSP okay. do that my mom has been lobbying for years in DC for um, 988, if y'all aren't familiar, I hope everybody is, but 911 311 now 988 is the um the suicide hotline mental health number. So a lot easier to remember. 
Um, where are you doing your advertising for the event? Like, how are you getting people's attention to come? Well, being our first year, it's a small group of volunteers. Um, but we we are doing as much as we can with um, with social media. We are we're all personally getting out um, with to everybody that we know. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to think. She was a news on that radio the other day, um, working with another, um, with a sugar land resident who used to be an ABC uh, news reporter. And he's, he's like, I know how I'm going to get you on TV. So we are still promoting the walk as best as we can. Um, a lot of the, um, the written publications that you know we've been working on, some of those are going to be um, put in April's uh, written publications. For, as volunteers, we're doing as much as we can while we all have families and full-time jobs. Kelsey, did you have a question or comment? No? Any other? Heather? So, Kimberly, um, again, the, the fees that were for the venue I guess just some history on it. how are those fees determined? What what would those have been used for? Like, why do we have fees on the rental? Uh, so so fees for our facilities are for um, they for a multitude of things, right? For the for the upkeep of the facility, for for cleaning the facility, for maintenance the facility. Um, all of our all of our building rentals, pavilion rentals. This is for the the crown. Uh, sorry for the uh, for Breast River Park for the bowl area. So that will include the new. Playground pavilion and that that whole grass bowl area, um, and then they'll be you know for all the sidewalks and stuff that they they do the walk on. So it's really it's 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 to recoup city infrastructure costs, staff costs, and et cetera. Is, is what these rental fees are based on. And um, the uh, city council looks at them annually, um, and they they've been historically sort of just going up by CPI of sort of you know of incremental increase every year. So I'm sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Just real quick. Yeah, are, I, will there be staff? City staff at the event? No, there will not be city staff. Oh, okay. the be, there, there are city staff that work on weekends that will come by if, if they're needed uh, on call city staff or, or maintenance staff, but, but there won't be city staff staffing the event. Okay, so this, I want to recap. Uh, I have another have, question. You, have, you asked a very good question. Oh, you have a question? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just a technicality on like the application for this and um, you know, and maybe something to consider moving forward for other events that may be similar where they're representing some national organization. I guess in the in the application, does it specify like what how like what type of organization it has to be? Like could they what if they had just put, you know, one of their addresses as the address for like how do you know the difference or what's the requirement? Like is there any specific information on how you fill that out on the application? Yes, we require proof of your 501c3, which is a federal application. So we go by the address that's on that, that federal application. So if if this, you know, for an organization like this, if they, you know, this is their first year, but if in future years they want to create their own 501c3, that's certainly something that, that they could do that you know meet all of the criteria. But um but we go we go by the um by the the, the federal document. Okay. Yes. I just I just have a clarifying question, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. If the fee the what we're trying to get waived the fee you it, you said it's used for maintenance and upkeep and and to recoup the the park. If we exempt it, will there be staff to do what is done without that money? Yeah, it it will it, it it'll it'll go on as 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 planned. It, okay. Um, okay. So recap it, what you had asked initially, um, one, one of, I guess the uh, ASFP, if, if that's correct, I want to make sure that I heard it correctly. You are not charging for the walk. Mm -hmm. Registration is free. Mm -hmm. You're just taking okay. donations. Just taking donations as part of the registration process. Donations strictly up to the individual to donate as much or none at all. Okay, and uh, the ones that uh, nineteen thousand dollars though y'all have actually collected as part of the donation, half will stay here in this local chapter, and half will go to the national chapter. Okay. Just another question. <laughs> <laughs> it's registered so far. Do you know? It was. It was said. 
Mm -hmm. It was around 200. And we expect that to continue to increase as we, we're now a month away from the walk. So as we've neared the walk date, it's starting to, to get awareness, more and more awareness. When people get their kids slowly scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> So is this just a walk, not a 5K? Or, okay. it's, it's a 5K walk, but it's not a race. It's not time. It's not a run. It's just a okay. walk. I mean, there's a lot of running organizations here in the Sugarland area, great ones. Uh, my comment to you is reach out to them because that they have huge connections. I mean, I belong to two here alone in the Sugarland area. Fit just for the team Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. 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 One more question, Kimberly. Um, it, have there been other appeals and exceptions like waivers in the past or uh, you know other entities that are having this issue is this common or so the last two appeals that came to the parks board were in the last couple of years i believe and i yeah. um one was one was denied uh, the one that was um it was a fort Bend organization and the other one was approved because they changed their, their address to uh, sugarland po box so they were um they met all the criteria at that point if my memory serves me right, the one that uh, was denied, they were making money as part of the registration process. Mm -hmm. Correct? I so. remember that? I that. Yes. I remember. Okay. But they're not making, I just want to clarify that y'all aren't requesting registration fees. No. Right. It's worded. If, um, their, the website is on those little postcards. The way that it's worded, that registration is completely free. However, um, you know, to solicit donations of 150 is, um, I think it says, like, strongly encouraged. You and then you get a t-shirt. You get a t-shirt. <laughs> sure. on the back. Um, here's a kind of a compromise in terms of, I think y'all would consider this. If we were to waive this fee, could y'all still come up with a deposit? Because to me, that's a deposit just in case yes. something happens. The deposit is always required. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Just I'm not sure. Yes, we went to. No, I'm not going to. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone. That was not. I'll say this. I'm sorry. Can you just say you would absolutely love to put the parks logo on the shirt as well? Like, like, <laughs> and, and also, um, it would be an in-kind donation, so it would also be a tax benefit to the city's for it. Oh, um, any other comments or questions? <laughs> Swing the pot, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just comment. I, I have I've been quite quite silent today, yeah. but. No, because I'm, I'm I'm taking my medication, which makes me very. Where's that dude? So either it keeps me quiet or it keeps me loud. So no, basically, I mean, it's good cause what you guys are doing, and yeah, I'm glad that uh, you know Ojeda here pulled out some points for everyone's kind of making out little questions. Or so, so I'm glad that uh, you guys are pushing along, and you had to make your stand. I, you know, I get you guys. So, so yeah, it's it's great. That's my comments. So I don't want to have any questions really because it's all like yeah, asked pretty much. It will also help us for next time uh, around to, to really understand. It's our first time planning this. Um, we were more than happy to do it, excited to to be able to do this, and you know, we're we're happy so far with the with the progress that we've had. Would you also consider um, adding the local address as part of the process? Of next year, that would be a question for the foundation. The room is volunteers. Um, I, I asked because, that question. yeah, I ask because you know we we we've, we've actually denied uh, uh, exemptions for the fees. Part of it is because they they they're collecting fees and y'all are not. But at the same time, the other uh, organization were able to uh, modify their address to have it local. I mean. We as a board want to follow the rules and also the, some of the rec recommendations, but you know there's other consideration where that's why we're asking all these questions. Mm -hmm. But we have to follow the rules of the city of Sugarland, and we we don't we don't take things lightly. We do ask all these questions. Uh, I think it's valid the way we act, but also we take in heavy consideration as part of the uh, the staff as well. Um, but any other comments on the unit? Yeah, I think that's...
All right, I mean, y'all ready for a motion? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll make a motion. I'd like to take a motion to consider of an action on the recommendation for the authorization of the Fort Bend hike or Hope Volunteer Planning Committee appeal for fee exemption to the city manager. Now I'm asking for an exemption appeal. Okay, mm -hmm. so that appeal. So all those in favor? Motion first. No, no, I want to ask for a motion for between, but I'm going to ask the question anyone. as the motion that carries through. So okay. I'll, anyone has a, you want to make a motion? Yes, I make the motion. Second? I'll second the motion to, to waive the fee. To waive the, the fee. fee. Mm -hmm. I'll second the motion. Okay, Heather. It's just to waive the fee. So now we'll take uh, the actual the vote for it. Mm -hmm. Those in favor to waive the fee, we'll just raise our hands, okay? We'll raise your hands. All right. As unanimous, it's, it carries over. We will we will uh, make the recommendations to waive the fee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think it's a great organization. Uh, Y'all do really well. Uh, I look forward to it. Come on with us. <laughs> and you don't have to put the parts board on. Not a condition, but y'all want to get another shirt. I'll get another shirt. He said, put Joe's picture on it. Joe's picture. Joe's picture. The next item we have on here is the director's report. So, Mr. Joe Tresher, director of Park. Parks and Recreation will be presenting. Thank you. Covered a lot of ground tonight, so I'll probably make this fairly brief. Um, been a busy couple of months. Uh, really great progress out at Brazos River Park. Talked about that where the walk will be tonight. We think the project will be complete uh, by the early part of April. They're That's making catchy. great progress out there. The weather's really cooperated. Um, you know, this is the project with the picnic pavilion, playground, um, the walkways around it. Uh, so ties in nicely with the restroom that's already there, right across the street from the, the tile mosaic um, at the Overlook. So really excited about this project. Uh, this is this is William's daughter. This is your oldest, this is your oldest daughter. Um, so, so she's anxiously waiting for the playground to be ready. So this is probably going to be our tallest. Uh, probably not. Not probably. It will be our tallest, biggest playground unit that we have in the city. The one, especially the one to the right. Uh, so anxious, Joe, that it. when I turned my back to uh, text a picture to mom. Uh, she had gone through the orange fence and went up to the <laughs> third floor and then came down and then told me, your white protection stuff didn't keep me off of it. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. Well, it'll be open to all the kids really soon. You can legally just. <laughs> okay, other projects uh, in the area that are going on there at Brad's River Park. The pump track, I know you've heard a lot of a lot about this over the last few months. Uh, the contractor really made good progress. We opened it up today or yesterday. End of the day yesterday. We wanted to get it open for spring breaks. The kids that are off could get out on it. Went by today. A lot of kids were out there enjoying it. And um, you know, it it's it's really it, it's for all ages, but it's probably a really great attraction, especially for probably upper elementary all the way through high school uh, will really, really, really enjoy it as well as adults. It's a great tie into all the mountain bike trails that are at Brazos River Park. So really, really looking at providing as many kind of bike enthusiast activities out there at the park as we can. And then uh, up on the upper right, the Go Ape uh, facility, they're doing a soft opening this week. They wanted to um, Get the ball rolling during spring break. Their their official opening. They're a little bit behind schedule construction wise because this facility is probably one of their biggest ones in the country, and it it will have their longest zip line within their organization with Go Ape. But this is 
at 16 locations around the country now. So I think it's taken them a little more, a little longer to build than, than they originally anticipated. But they have their staff on board uh, that's trained. So they are taking people out this week. They're still doing some finishing touches. And then they also have to follow up with their official office building on site. Uh, that, that's going to come a little bit later. But uh, it's blending in really nicely with the forest environment out there at Brass River Park. The trees are starting to leaf out now. And I think as the trees leaf out, uh, you'll really it'll really start to blend nicely with, with the surrounding there in the park. Uh, kind of on maintenance matters, you know, a ball field and soccer starting up, softball, baseball. I mean, one of the most important things for this, you know, the youth sports groups is the, this field lighting. So um, our staff, we used to contract this service out, but William's staff is, has learned how to you know, take care of the, the lighting. You have to rent these lifts that are, that's probably 70 feet in the air uh, to get up there and change out those lamps. And when you're down on the ground, they don't look very big, which when you get up there and you take them down, <laughs> the, you know, the lights themselves are like this big. So it's a handful to get up there and do that. So it, it spreads our dollars a lot further, not having to contract this service out. Uh, we can use it, you know, the more money goes to the park. So our guys are doing a great job of doing that. And then one of the things I like to point out is they're, they're really good at protecting the ground so they're not, they put these mats down at the bottom so they're not you know, running the ground and everything. So um, they they got this done at, at numerous parks throughout the city and parking lots as well. Uh, one of our exciting events from last month uh, in February was the Trigger Gala, which is the dad-daughter dance. It goes on, it, it's held right after um, Valentine's uh, Day. So uh, we had, it was sold out in advance, a little over 200 people could attend. It's held at the Imperial Park Recreation Center. So you can see a lot of folks having fun. They have like the uh, you know, pictures, taking spots and dancing and things that go on. And so it was, um, it was um, like action hero, action hero themed this year. So uh, superheroes. So you you're the expert on it. I was trying to figure out what's behind him now. Yeah. So it was, it was a lot of fun. I don't think it was sold out. But. Okay, and then we had our league openings. Uh, always a big, big time of year uh, for for the sports leagues. So we had Sugarland Little League, First Colony Little League, and Sugarland Girls Softball. Council members uh, made it all out to to the leagues at the various openings. The mayor throwing out the first pitch there at base at First Colony. Uh, four council members, well, three council members and me and Orion from the Space Cowboys, or at Girls Softball, and, and Council Member Lane at uh, Sugarland Little League. Um, mm. Activities at our senior center, uh, always active time there, senior center. So uh, they had a casino day uh, at the senior center with Elvis in the building. <laughs> it was uh, a good time for the seniors there. So they they're uh, always doing something new and new and exciting there for the seniors. So that, that looked like a lot of fun. Another thing they did at the senior center. I thought this was funny. We got you to have your picture made with the groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> they can share, you know, share it on Facebook. Or whatever. There you go. We celebrate everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's... Every day is a celebration. <laughs> yeah, um, happy every day. Yeah, happy every day. I wanted to really acknowledge Kimberly and her staff uh, putting on the third annual chess fest uh, here at Sugarland Town Square. <laughs> and it's continues to grow each year. Uh, this is their effort to try to just have some kind of innovative new things uh, going on in the city. You know, not every festival all has to be about food or fireworks or whatever. You know, we've got chess as it, it's it's a, and I, I was shocked at how many people participate in it, uh, but you can see it was a great crowd and it, it's been growing every year. I had a really good day, really good day. So I had a really good turnout. So you can go ahead. Don't miss anything. No, I I touch on? Okay. We just have a few, several pictures. Just so you can get a kind of an idea of 
you know, there's like a lot of concentration going on. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, oh, not quiet. Really real quiet. <laughs> the, the, the diversity of ages and, and you know, and, and nationalities, and, and I mean, it's just a huge mix of people that, that we don't normally see at our, at our regular, at our other events, that we, traditional events that we do, so it's really great. <laughs> Yeah, it really fills up out square. And then the top left photo, I just have to, that's blindfold chess. So that gentleman there, he's a chess master, and he is doing this blindfolded. There's a person with a megaphone that's telling him what moves the other person is making, and then he communicates to that person what the next move that he's making is. So he's playing this entire game in his head. Memory. Wow. Oh, it's wow. just, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, I saw this posted on social media. It's pretty yeah. cool. Did he win? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, he was our, and he was our winner for the, the the tournament. There's a tournament that happens at the end of the day, and he was he was the winner of that tournament. Not, it should surprise you, really. <laughs> yeah, we hope to continue to be able to host this tournament or this uh, chess fest every year. Uh, this was really exciting. It happened uh, last week. Uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors. Um, You've probably seen their ads on TV, though a lot of times they'll have people you know, doing action things uh, in their commercials. They reached out to the city, just like through our email address, our, our general parks email address, and asking if they could, you know, if we would consider having them in some of our facilities to um, film some of their commercials. And so Kimberly and staff worked with them to arrange the uh, Imperial Park Recreation Center and Imperial Park for various activities. They did uh, pickleball, they did volleyball, basketball, and then soccer outside. So it was an all day thing. They showed up uh, at like 5 36 o'clock in the morning. There was a bunch of panel trucks and there was a big RV kind of place for a dressing room and makeup area. And there was a, they had a director and all, all the kind of people that go into doing that. The, the, the owners of the academy, like the Big wigs for Academy were there kind of observing everything. So it's a pretty full day out there uh, doing all this filming. And the, the only the only thing that didn't go great was we found out that there the, the market for these commercials is going to be in the Midwest. Uh, so we're uh, probably not going to see them down here in Sugarland. So if you want to see them, we'll have to go on YouTube uh, to see to see them. Well, we'll share them as soon as they're out. So you don't get on the commercial. No, no, they didn't no, no, ask us. No, no, no. Yeah, they had all their extras planned, and um, we were not one of them. <laughs> John was playing soccer. But no, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting. And you'll see under that black tent there, that's all. those are all the academy people. So they're watching on their screen and they're making notes on their, you know, of what shots they like. Because they shot multiple shots. They started first thing in the morning and went until six in all these different locations. Mm -hmm. And so they're making their notes. Then the director is also, you know, yelling out his note. <laughs> uh, he's closer up to the, the shooting. So it's really, it was really amazing to, to watch. It's quite a process. I, you know, because I thought, I thought, okay, Academy's going to come. There's going to be like a guy with a camera and it's not going to be a I rolled up, I slept around 5.30 and there's, you know, the trailer and all these different trailers with all this stuff. And it was, it was quite the production. <laughs> but they were very complimentary of staff and they said, next time we, we have something, we're coming to y'all first. You should say, <laughs> if we get in on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, they do, they, they, they insisted on renting the gym yep. out since they took a lot of that. We, we tried, we tried to give it to them, you know, for you know, for publicity's sake, you know, to let them. But they insisted on renting out okay. everything for the day and paying. So like, no, Academy has on the site. Right, love me in Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, just cut upcoming events. We've got the kite festival coming up on the twenty fifth, and also the same day we're doing a, a ribbon cutting for the pump track that morning at nine a.m. and then the kite fest starts at ten a.m. So that'll be a full day out at uh, Brad's River Park and uh, Crown Festival Park on the 25th. So if, yeah. we'd love to have everybody out and, and recognize y'all at the ribbon cutting if you make it out that morning. Uh, Brad's River Park phase three, you saw the, the construction uh, pictures there. It's scheduled to be finished at the end of March, hopefully in time for the Kite Fest, but they may be putting the finishing touches on it. But we have a ribbon cutting scheduled for it on April 11th. And we'll send these dates out to everybody so uh, so you'll know. And then uh, the Go Ape was originally scheduled for the end of March, but 
they're needing a little bit more time to get it done. So we're working with them to determine exactly when that ribbon cutting grand opening is going to be. And then uh, two other things that are pretty exciting that are coming up in early May is this will be the second year of the Sugarland Classic Mountain Bike Race in uh, Brazos River Park. Um, it was held last year. It was a big success for the local mountain biking community. So they're really excited to come back and we think the numbers will grow. And uh, they, they have held a lot of activities in Town Square kind of during that race. It's a two day, it's a two day event. So, uh, and it brings people from probably all over the state to come down and race in this, uh, this, uh, this uh, bike race. And on the same day, or on that Saturday anyway, there's planned food truck festival at uh, Brass River Park. So it should be a very, very uh, lively time at uh, Brass River Park uh, in the next couple of months. And then I will leave you with some beautiful uh, <laughs> new bonnets and Indian paintbrush that are starting to pop up all over Brass River Park and along the new road and Memorial Park and uh, hats off to Phoneland and her group of volunteers who um, are very dedicated in, in getting out and trying to cultivate more and more wildflowers uh, in, in our parks. And we've gotten grants for it. We you know, try to get funding any way we can to try to enhance the, the wildflower meadows out there. And they're, they're really starting to take off. Uh, I think if we get some rain uh, <laughs> this week, like we're supposed to, it'll help out even more. But uh, each year they get better and better. They reseed. And we're very cautious with when you mow. You have to mow the right time of the year so they'll reseed properly. So um, I'll leave y'all with that. And then if we have any questions on anything going on in the park system, we're happy to have us. Quick question. Are, are you advertising the uh, pump track ribbon cutting anywhere? I haven't seen it. You have social media unless I missed it. We we just posted it on right. social media just as kind of a heads up, but we'll we'll hit a little bit stronger. Um and we, yeah, we, yeah. and we just put out a press release on it. Yeah, so it yeah. But we just put it this week. Yeah, we were cautious because we didn't want people to to start writing it before it was done. So yeah. we were very cautious about when we were putting out that information. So since it was just done last night, now we're now we have full steam ahead. Did they were that. They were writing it before we were done, but we managed, we managed through it. We got the grass down. And we're watering a lot. It's 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 there now, so it's ready. What was the invite set out for the opening? I don't recall getting that. I don't know. I don't know if it was that. Or the pump? I mean, the pump, pump track? Not sure. All right, we'll have to follow we'll up on that. Check. Yeah, we we usually send them two weeks in advance, so we're probably close. Yeah, the, the photos were nice. It's like that Channel 11 demo moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. Yeah. Well, nice. Yeah, I want to take a picture. Of that. So, I have a uh, comment and question about the uh, Go Ape, because I know we're saying to be determined, stuff like that. Um, you know, actually, I wasn't talking about that one. Actually, I was talking about the international. So I don't know why. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it in. It's kicking it in. I was like, it's kind of. Because that, uh, but anyway, so it's basically about iFest and it was coming in. And uh, I know we're still there's still availability for um, us to do judging, right? Um, I don't know for what yeah, I know. She, if you responded yeah, quickly, yeah, I think the yeah. first stick yeah. or yeah. five or six was supposed to be chosen, yeah. but uh, like I responded immediately and then I they sent me a response back. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, but individually, though, I think me too. Okay, yeah. so the good thing is, that, yeah, because you I, messed up it on your no, no, I, I, I saw it, I saw it, just I need to get back to it again. Did you want to judge? Yeah, yeah, because no. I was like trying to, I was trying to figure out how to do because my my what family's gonna do the martial arts performance yeah. there too. Yeah, no, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we like we like a group. I'll start, we start judging everybody. Did you send them anymore? Or no, no, not yet. Okay. I need to. <laughs> please do. Please, yes. please just respond. No, I just want to see if it's closed yet or not. But I think that they had their list of people, but yeah, we can. We do want a golf cart though to get the kite. <laughs> no, no, because with the comment, I always like getting that. No, but the, I'm uh, better years. It was great to do that. I uh, can't wait for this year too. I know it's so always fun. Every year is always good. Mm -hmm. Every year, pray for good weather. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? No, great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good, good so, report, Jeff. Well, that being said, uh, we are concluding the actual. Uh, so we'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll motion. 
Andy, second? I'll second. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for everyone on your time and thank you all for coming out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're so happy for you. <laughs> uh, I guess turn on.